So anyway, I think that we can start. Um, so Angus, thank you very much for accepting this invitation. Uh, very excited to have you with us, the, the topic that you are going to be doing. Um, and also to start this um, collaboration, we've been talking with Angus and working with Angus outside this uh, webinar, the, this context, and uh, we are planning to develop a more close collaboration between Metaforum and the Cybernetic uh, Society. Uh, that um, uh, Angus is uh, well is uh, is leading with the uh, um, in the last uh, few years and um, so anyway really nice to have you with us and um, very excited with your topic um, as usual we normally have like the presentation and it's up to you to decide if you would prefer to be interrupted during the presentation or you would prefer to wait with questions and do the questions by the end. Uh, okay, so you're asking me to answer that question? Yes. Uh, I think it's a question of the nature of the question. If it's something, for example, if I'm really unclear on what I'm saying, you can interrupt me. Uh, if you think that something is so um, crazy, wrong, anomalous, strange, that you need to challenge it immediately, mm -hmm. please go ahead. If it's something that you would like to inquire on, but it'll wait, Right, it's the usual sort of thing. I don't mind being interrupted as long as, uh, as it were, this is going to be helpful for the whole group. Okay, so those of you that have questions but are not that urgent, please put them in the chat and then we'll, we'll organize the questions by the end, um, those that are not urgent. And hello, Wolfgang, and hello, Steve. Steve. Welcome today. Hello. Yeah, hello, hello, Angela. Hello. I just have an issue with my camera. <laughs> I'm back on the screen in, in, in a second. That's all right. That's all right. Okay, Angus, so would you like to introduce yourself and, um, and uh, start the webinar? Thank you very much. Uh, let me share. Well, let me just say, first of all, because I was first screen would only say this. Um, thank you for your introduction, um, Angela. And thank you very much, everybody, for inviting me to come and turning up and listening to me and you do me a great deal of respect and I appreciate that very much. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you will find the time useful. Um, Angela introduced me in relation to the Cybernetic Society. I'm not sure it's correct to say that I'm leading it. Uh, we developed a vision and I took an active role in developing that vision and have been serving the society to try and help it to move forward. Uh, unfortunately, the present situation, because of family circumstances, I will be withdrawing from that role after our AGM next month, but I hope to remain active in the community uh, as we go forward. Um, let me say then, thank you very much, and I, I hope this will be an interesting talk. I am going to share my screen, and as I was saying to... Um, Angela, I'm Angela, I am doing what I never do, which is a presentation full of full of text. Uh, mostly I try to try and have use a lot more illustrations and graphics and things like that. And on this occasion, for some strange reason, I decided not to. I think I thought that maybe there were all sorts of uh, bright, intelligent, technical people who would value having a little bit of content. But it's also because I wrote a little working paper to support what I was thinking through, because I found it a very useful question. It's one that I've been working on for more than 20 years, 30 years perhaps, in relation to organizations. And so to introduce myself very briefly, uh, in addition to the present role that I have, I, uh, I have a consulting organization that's 30 years old. Um, and has worked with organizations before many different large and small organizations, NGOs, international corporations. Uh, before that, I was the CEO of a tech business that produced a world first new technology, um, basically around the cybernetic field of the relationship between organizations and their customers, which is relevant to the talk that we're going to be doing today. Um, I spent 10 years working with various eight with one key agency in developing their methodologies and know-how and one of the consequences of that is that it led me to getting a full research chair and becoming a professor around themes that are somewhat related in fact to this 
uh, as we'll perhaps touch on. Um, and for the last 10 years, I've been working on a theory uh, related to the, to the topic that we are talking about. So it's been something that's occupied me for many decades. Uh, I have chaired a number of companies. I've been the CEO of a number of companies and I've consulted with dozens of organizations and worked with them on themes and used VSM in relationship to this, along with a wide variety of cybernetic approaches. So, um, let me move on and say that my topic, my structure of this topic is going to be three main topical steps. The first one is, um, is to consider, uh, well, first of all, before going into the three, it's to say, I, I can imagine that pretty much everything, every one of the points that I make might be disagreed with by somebody or other, in, if not many of you in the talk, I don't know. Um, it's not because I'm trying to be contentious or provocative, but in thinking about some of these themes, I find that there are many commonly held views that I find it's hard to, sus I find hard to sustain when I think them through. And so in, in that sense, I, I welcome this as, a, as an inquiry and an exploration of some new views. And I'm gonna try and lay out some of my concerns on the one hand and some of the positive aspects on the other hand, of, of how I see the identity of organizations and to think about how those, uh, how those relate to VSM applications in particular. And, and I'll look at that through three different topical steps. The first of those steps is to just ask the question, what do we mean by the word identity to give it some framework for that? And that will, in a sense, be a procedural or epistemological, even ontological question. Um, what is understood by the word identity? And um, in so doing, what do we understand as the identity of an organization? Identity here, I'm talking about in relation specifically to probably all living organisms, but certainly to business organizations and other institutional organizations, including government departments and so on. And I'll suggest that it's fundamental to its existence. It's not a branding. It's not something external. It's something not something read into it by an analyst, including a VSM one. It's not attached to it by a manager. It's intrinsic to the actual operation of the organization. So then to ask a little bit more, well, in what way then? What is the nature of this identity? What actually is it? How does it function? What does it work? And by which kind of theoretical approach or approaches can we understand it best or well at the moment? And then my third step is to ask, what does this mean for the practitioner? Um, that's consultants, that's managers. It's also perhaps the, the, the practitioner who is an academic who's trying to develop theoretical understandings and practices on behalf of the world. So in that respect, um, we can relate VSM to these various steps. So before diving into those, let's take a look at three very different cases to try and give up um, a kind of framework for thinking about identity as it's operated. The first I choose is Ulfbert. Um, this we're talking about something that ran from the 8th to the 10th century, about three centuries, the Viking Age. It was a sword, and it was a sword that was branded. So it was literally branded. It's a piece of steel, and it had hammered into it the, four, the name Ulfbert with two crosses. And the two crosses signify that it probably had a relationship to a bishop. When tomographic analysis was done of this, they found that there were techniques that were being used in the construction of this kind of crucible steel that uh, we do not know how to reproduce today. And this is quite true, quite the case with a number of these major old sword making techniques. We also find that this, uh, this process of making the sword was done by blacksmiths um, who were not literate and they were not academic, they were not educated, they were craft people highly skilled craft people, but craft people. So there was some kind of sword master that provided a framework for this organization. 
um, which followed, which was maintained for almost 300 years. Uh, it may have been continued uh, by a family line, but the institutional support included various kings who banned smuggled sails to foreigners. Why? Because the sword was so brilliant, so superior in battle that it was able to destroy the swords that uh, uh, ordinary swords, they cracked or broke or bent when they struck uh, these swords. Vikings valued them so much that they buried them with their heroes. It was traded across Europe and it was seen as a life enhancing luxury for noblemen. So what we have here is is a thing which gets made. Uh, it gets made over centuries. It's branded. It has a brand in that sense. It's It's got something put onto it to say it, this is where it comes from. It has a legitimacy of coming from a particular provenance, and behind that provenance is a unique capability for making these swords that didn't exist anywhere else in Europe at the time, and it enabled them to make something exemplary, and it was experienced in the moments of truth that actually took place in battle. If we look at a second case, and I'm deliberately looking back backwards as well as something more like the present. Let's look at the Cistercians as a second case. Uh, this is obviously um, a body, a monastic body that was founded as part of the Catholic, um, the general Catholic Church. It was legitimized by the Pope uh, and um, it began in 1098 at one particular location when it was founded by Robert of Melesme um, near Dijon. Um, they had a rule, and this rule dictated how the people inside the order would behave pretty much literally all through the course of the day. And it had a number of conceptual innovations for how things would work. One of those was a notion of self-sufficiency and the principle that work is prayer. To work is to pray. And this principle, to work is to pray, uh, enabled lay members to join the community to work as, for example, farm workers and in other practical roles under the protection of the monasteries so that they were freed or, or were able to escape the arbitrary control of local nobles. They had a more decent, regular life. They were more promised something that would support them in their religious community. Um, they were schooled and trained in various crafts. The young would be trained uh, through that process. They were protected. And this particular order developed unique capabilities at the time for water engineering. They're, they made a promise. They went to the nobleman and said, um, land you do not want. Please give us the land you don't want. And by giving us the land you don't want, you do good for your own souls, for your future but we only want land you don't want. They took this land and they transformed it through drainage, through the use of sheep and sheep droppings or manure. And the, as a result, they produced wool. It was a really important, very important product at the time. And they, they were the major producers of wool. They were so influential that, for example, in England, the chancellor sat on the wool sack, literally a sack of wool, in order to demonstrate the importance of wool to the economy of England. They fundamentally changed the landscape in huge parts of um, England, Germany, France, Flanders and elsewhere. Many towns were founded around Berlin, for example. They changed the social order in many of these areas. They were huge powers. What you need to think of them is as an economic power across Europe that would be something like, you know, the equivalent of Amazon and Apple rolled together in today's economic terms, something like that. Very, very wealthy. Um, they were the wealthiest institution in England, for example, when Thomas Cromwell closed them down. And they've got a, they've got a deep institutional structure for how they do things and a model. And this model is repeated from monastery to monastery to monastery. Now, if we take a third case, Hertz also has a model that it repeats from outlet to outlet to outlet to outlet. And this is a very common pattern inside organizations. There's some kind of model, this gets repeated. And it gets repeated through times and through different locations. Is somebody trying to ask me a question? Bei mir, wie ging ich? Ich würde denen vorschlagen, den, den 1. Juli, den, Sonnt, den Donnerstag, ob das bei denen möglich ist. Okay. Okay. 
Is somebody asking me a question? If so, let me stop this because I'm hearing some German, but uh, I... No, don't worry. It's just, um, I think that is uh, Wolfgang that forgot to switch off his microphone. So okay. I, I'll, I'll carry on then. Yeah. I wasn't sure if there was a question being asked. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so when we look at a company like Hertz, which is picked more or less at random uh, for no particular special reason why Hertz, except that I happen to write a paper uh, which has just been accepted for publication, a big paper on this related subject, and I randomly picked Hertz in it. So what we have is a series of encounters, an encounter between a customer and Hertz at a particular point of, deliver, of service delivery, there's an ordering process and things happen. And, and what uh, takes place in this ongoing series of processes across the globe is a coordinated series of ongoing actions and micro actions, process flows of micro processes, as was the case with the other two, we're just highlighting them here. Streams of customers would come and repeat customers and this would constitute an ongoing flow of activity. So there'd be process flows of the company that meet in exchange with the life process flows and social flows and wishes and so on of customers. And each encounter is a touch point or moment of truth. It's a fulcrum, it's recognized in the marketing community as the central axis. And in so far as the organization exists in order to produce something of that will be valued by customers so that some exchange takes place that enables the organization to go on. The activity that we think of and associate with system one in the VSM model, this becomes the focus of marketing, but it's also the focus of innovation, of development, of organization, of production, of the business model, the financial model, the cultural model of the organization around this process of delivering value to some people or to some or other organizations in the world. And this is supported by an organizational closure. And I'm using here, the, I'll talk about it, Zs and Ss, the, the processual structure, the structural and processual structure of organization that closes off in this organizational closure and makes this organization unique. Hertz is not the same as any other rental company, although similar to very many. And this is a kind of deep brand notion. So. What then do we think of as identity? And as my, the structure that I use, will use some different colors for the heading so that you know which part of the structure we're in. When we look at this, uh, first of all, uh, identity is not the logo. The logo is a symbol system. It's a sign that there is an identity there. It's something that promises. An old name for it was a trust mark. You can trust that this comes from this. So the Ulfbert sword was branded in order to be able to say, this is a legitimate, this is a legitimate sword made in the proper way. And as we find today with the rip-off watches from the various famous brands, there were rip-off swords, and those rip-off swords used to break, but they usually didn't have the exact correct branding sign. And so people who knew what they were talking about, what they were looking for, were able to buy the legitimate tool. So what we, what we think of with identity is not something external. It's not the equivalent of a person's name, their email address, their password, num password or passport numbers that can be stolen. Those things can be stolen, but you can't just take somebody's identity out of them because it's somehow fundamentally in the process of them living who they are, what they are in the way that they are as an ongoing process. So that's Logo is a signal, not the fundamental identity we're concerned with. And nor do I think that identity is an analyst's view of the organization. It's, it's probably, uh, typically, it's an analyst's view of their model. They're creating a model or a structure or a point of view on some aspect of the world. And they rightly recognize that the, in the model, the model has an identity insofar as it is a selection, a filter from the richness of the world, and it is looking at some aspect. You can see, for example, that in one company, you might make a model or analyze or look at the accounting system, and you might separately look at the manufacturing system of the company. And the, they're two different 
models. They're two different ways of analyzing or thinking about the organization. And therefore, at the systems level, they are two different identities. But they are both aspects of the fundamental identity of the organization. And these two work together. They interact with each other insofar as at the at ground level of what actually goes on in the organization, those processes embed both aspects routinely in what is happening, as well as others, as we'll look at. So when, we, when I consider the um, identity of an organization or firm, um, I'm interested in something deeper than an analyst's view. And this also means something deeper than the kind of view that a manager who comes into an organization who doesn't know it might just have about what it is. Uh, someone enters the organization new at a senior level, thinks they understand it all, doesn't have the background, doesn't understand, hasn't worked their way in and makes decisions and does things that may or may not be in accord with the organization the way it truly is. So if we look at what we mean by identity, it's concerned fundamentally with the way a company produces itself. And that's going to be the proposition that I'm proposing and that we look at. It's a self-actuation process, a logical loop um, in which organizations conserve their own identity and maintain them in the ongoing flow of their activities. They produce their own details, they produce their own parts, and in the act of producing their own parts or details, those parts constitute what, what the organization is. So it produces its own activities and details, those activities and details produce it, its activity. So it's all in an ongoing processual flow in a logical loop and also very often in a time loop in, in the sense that many things get repeated. Situations produce the same kind of situation again and again, for example. And situations are those things which are produced by people in the world, observing the world, responding to the world, and therefore constituting their situations. The combinations of those produce macro situations between different people. This then is an organization-wide mesh of processes and responses involving people and their observation of the world. So the question might be, well, in what way, what kind of theoretical model, framework, might we use to try and understand this aspect of identity? And having already said that's what I think it is, I'm, I'm now, in a way, I'm getting, I got there, not by going through this kind of question, which I'm now, as it were, reversing out. One of the things that's really interested me, and I spent a lot of time learning about it for 40 years, is the way the sociology of science, the way science culturally formed itself as a result of certain individuals and groups of people and certain institutions like the Royal Society. And um, how, for example, Newton was influenced by the Anglican Church in England to publish his Principia Mathematica in the way that he did, so that he published it with certain things and not other things, how he left out some things and put in other things in certain ways in order to deal with the problems of protest movements and conflicts and rebellions and so on that were taking place at the time. So what kind of scientific framework do we need to use? And I think the problem is that there are fundamental problems in the base epistemology that rules most of the orthodox science today. This um, privileges the quantitative data while not merely diminishing, but often intending to ignore the qualitative aspects of things. And it presupposes certain facts about how the world works, um, which we'll touch on in various ways, such as um, determinism, um, positivism, um, reductionism, and so on. And these, these um, deny the very stuff of what cybernetics is about. Um, if, you, if you relegate everything in the qualitative domain to the mere contingent uh, which can be ignored, the contingent factors that are not central to the scientific method. In fact, you should take them out because that is subjective and science should be objective. If you do that, 
then you actually eliminate the very stuff of what cybernetics is dealing with, which is people observing their world, which has always got a qualitative dimension to it. So you, we crucially need to include the qualitative. And indeed, um, one of the aspects of cybernetics, the ternary uh, theory. So if we look at some of the key flaws in a bit slightly more detail. The first that I mentioned is the causal explanation of behavior that says that what goes on in the, in the behavior of individuals and organizations is something in a sense external to it. This is the domino theory or the billiard ball theory in which something happens to something and as a result of that impact, as it were from outside, a certain result must come about, something must be done. Uh, one ball hits another and the two balls behave in a way that depends on that force hitting it. Um, this kind of notion is still remarkably popular in modern science and it was um, is popular in various forms like neo-Darwinism and its genetic theory. A anyone who really knew cybernetics thoroughly and looked at the neo-Darwinian model of the gene would have known that the selfish gene model had to be wrong because it didn't it didn't take into account that we're dealing with living organisms that respond to their environment and that what we need to do is to think of the gene not as the driver and controller of life but as something more like a passive organ that gets played, after all, it's just producing proteins, that gets played by the living organism, which is its context and environment. Um, we also don't depend on analysis of energy in cybernetics. Cybernetics starts with information flows, not with energy flows. It presumes that organisms and entities exist in such a way that they can get hold of the energy they need. That's why animals go hunting or they go foraging for the food that they need to sustain their existence. So we are dealing with a different ontology and to that, uh, to that focus of energy, we can add in parity if you're familiar with that. Another problem is that what I call the jigsaw model. It's the idea of a system that says a system is assembled out of parts. This is maybe something like cars and bicycles and the old story that you can disassemble a bicycle, but you can't disassemble a frog and then reassemble it. So this is not the way that living organisms work, and I don't think it's the way organizations work either. So rather, what happens with these organizations and organisms is that they constitute their own details. They make their own constituent elements according to themselves in some way. They also tend to forget that human beings are different. So quite a lot of the models that you will find in complexity theory and elsewhere, agent modeling, um, rather treat these uh, as if um, all, all sort of entities are merely responding to certain rules and they don't take account of the fact that there's actually a fundamental divide in the um, causal structure of nature at the distinction level between on the one hand plants and animals and on the other hand humans and the fundamental distinction is the recursive ability of the human being to be able to observe their own interior and to be able to think about their own interior to be observe their own feelings and to and to consider whether those are the feelings they want to have the sense of uh, conscience for example as an experience the ability to look at choices and the ability to predict what kind of outcomes might come about by doing things and to choose between them and this is something i spoke with the american society for cybernetics about fairly recently so we've got to take into account that organizations are full of people and people have some ability to choose to a certain extent how they will behave they're not driven 100 percent by instinct and then there's the whole notion of systems theories, which I suspect that many of you uh, find very interesting, and so do I. But the question is, in what way do some of these systems theory might be limited in trying to understand identity? Um, I personally do not use the word system unless what I am trying to describe something like a machine. So anything that is machine-like, the internet is a system, the British legal system is a system, but the lawyers are not systems. And the reason I do that is because, first of all, I don't know which model of system you might be using, but I suspect that you might be using one in which this uh, 
not you, but someone uh, might be using a model or a picture of a system of the living organism, the lawyer, in such a way that you think of them as assembled out of parts, that maybe there's an emergence of something that's greater than the sum of the parts. And, and this doesn't work. Uh, this does, just doesn't uh, fit the reality of how living organisms really work um, any more than the notion of a root cause analysis functions when you don't have a deterministic model. There are various uh, extremely interesting theories that are argu arguing that organizations are effectively alive using complex adaptive systems models. And I have certainly found some of them extremely interesting, their analyses and, and their way of thinking about it. But they often suffer from the same problems of positivism, reductionism, and this notion in which they have a view of emergence in which the entity as a whole is assembled out of the interaction of parts that somehow or other go through some magical process in which something emerges out of it. And I don't think that's how it works. There's another version of this autocatalysis that looks at the chemistry or biochemistry process within a cell and relates and argues that organizations are alive and that they are indeed uh, social organisms and that the model of autocatalysis can help us to explain this. But in doing so, it makes the mistake that I measured earlier that it's equating what goes on in a protein, in the in protein activity or in protein processes and electrical processes in a cell with what goes on in a human being interacting with other human beings. So what it does do is demonstrate what you might call the organic fractal nature of the self-similarity in all levels of recursive organization in organic life. And it's the notion of wholeness that I do find very attractive. Um, some of you may also be interested in Lumen. You may take the view that there's, Lumen has much to offer, and indeed, he's a very interest, his theory is very interesting, and others have done very interesting work with it. But um, I, I, I'm aware that um, Humberto Maturana publicly stated that he disagreed with this application of autopoiesis to social organizations. Um, but I'm also aware that in a private conversation, he seemed to suggest that um, he took that stance in part because of the dangers in the Chilean regime at the time. But his method, which basically strips out the people and looks only at the communications between people, which he explicitly says he did because it made life much more much easier for modeling purposes. I think that what that does is leave out precisely the the interiority of human beings in their own self-observation of what's going on and their own capacity as a result of that to review what happens, their communication with themselves, for example. So what goes on in the embodied, the embodied uh, understanding and all of the different forms of communication that take place that are non-verbal, I think it's really important that we can take account. So I find that that's a model which it's not surprising that or that Maturana would say that it lacked enough detail um, because in a way it strips out so much of the real detail of what goes on in companies. So one of the fundamental principles of what we see in an organization is a meeting point between customers and company. Customers can be clients, businesses, all sorts of things. But at some level, there's people on one side who want to buy something or interact and gain some value from an organization. Maybe they're just churchgoers who go to a church, for example. And on the other side, there's the institution or organization that provides it. And this shows an, a kind of mirror image. And it's because in a way, the organization fits itself to its environment, to its customers, and the customers fit themselves to the organization that it's a well-known principle in the marketing world that customers buy things that in some way relate to their own sense of identity of who they are. They often buy things in order to try and be something or express themselves as something, and they find something in the organization that they can relate to. So 
the system one process in which something is delivered to a customer who finds it value and there's a co-creation of value at the point when it's experienced by the customer as observer and delivered by the organization as an observer from the other side. When that meets, something goes on, um, which is this moment of truth in which the two come together and this co-creation of value takes place. These are the crucible of trust, the micro situations that are regarded as the fundamental unit of marketing behavior and theory in the history of marketing over a number of decades. So this is the key point where something needs to happen. And the organization in some sense exists for the delivery of various kinds of these to various kinds of people in various kinds of ways at various kinds of times. And how does this come about? How does this take place? So I do think that when we look at identity, we're looking at something that's deep, it's recursive, it operates at all levels of the organization. If you have an organization with subsidiaries and within those different departments and within those different teams, there's something that's pervasive across the whole of that organization. At the same time, those different teams and units take on different things. Uh, an operating unit as a subsidiary in Germany will have different characteristics from one in Britain or South Korea. Similarly, an operating unit that's working in the marketing department will have different characteristics from the accounting or finance function. And if we take those two, marketing people in the marketing function will have certain characters that relate to marketing as a whole worldwide, the sort of pattern of what marketing is about. And in the finance or accounting department, there will be patterns that come from, from that world. And so there's an interplay between two, if you like, different identity modes that play together to produce something unique. So the different functions are somewhat different, but still share in something unique. So when we look at identity and we look at a recursive structure with multiple system ones, and we say that each of those system ones has its own system five identity, what we're saying is that that system five identity in a, in a healthy um, functioning organization close to its best, the system five unit for each of the system ones will have some relationship to the system five organization as a whole, but it will also vary according to the particular kinds of customers that it has, the particular things that it delivers to them, the ways in which that happens, what sort of skills are needed to make that happen. There's a very different skill, for example, in hammering a sword so it comes out like steel, or for example, looking after the landscape in order to be able to produce transform a boggy marsh into a healthy, vibrant, rich, important sheep, um, sheep farming zone. Um, and which water is being controlled and buildings and so on can be created. And one of the tools for uh, or ways of thinking that are very helpful this, this is Goethe's principle of metamorphosis and the fundamental work that he did on that, which I find extremely helpful as do many others. So the, the feedback system that I'm interested in, that I've been working on, I call proprio-poiesis, which means making itself according to itself. It's a mutually generative feedback and circular logic, not circular causality, a circular logic of activity in which we are both producers and products uh, in the cycle of life. So this takes from uh, the cybernetics of autopoiesis, it uh, learns various things from that. It learns from perceptual control theory, which is another, uh, which adds a great deal of very interesting and important work to cybernetics and understanding individuals. Also, what we can derive from the tradition of hermeneutics, which goes back to the 17th century at least, where you will find very fundamental and beautiful descriptions about how human beings filter from the world and interpret it in the process, um, which, which are really helpful in terms of interpreting things like second order cybernetics and the questions that it raises. I'm also very influenced by the philosopher Rudolf Steiner and his follower Owen Barfield. Steiner was the first interpreter of Goethe's scientific theory and described how, Stein, how Goethe was explaining uh, this order when he looked at plants, animals and so on, how he described a metamorphosis process in which the whole produced its own varying details, much as someone like Van Gogh, in a way, produces all of his various paintings, and they all have the mark of being a Van Gogh painting, not because he put his signature on them, but because they look like Van Gogh paintings in the first place. 
He also worked on human perception and various other aspects which I found helpful in his Geisteswissenschaft. And then there's the phenomenological tradition that grows out of that from those which I find highlighted by Henri Bortoft. And I found that very helpful in understanding various aspects of how organizations and people function. And last of all, to get to fundamental principles of cybernetics. And all of these can then be mapped against VSM in our understanding. It's also fascinating to realize that um, collective organization organisms are indeed the norm in society. I mean, every, every living organism above the single cell is a collection of living organisms. And some of them are really quite astonishing. I, I, I had no idea, for example, that a tree might consist of anything from 100,000 to a million living plants. So it's a, it's a plant of plants. It's a plant composed of plants. And the plants themselves are composed of cells. And the plants, in this case, are leaf organizations. Each, each leaf structure is itself a whole living plant, according to the Goethe and the contemporary scientific model developed by, um, uh, by a couple of British scientists, Harper and White. Um, so this, there are many of these whole forests that are considered to be living organisms, rhizomes, beehives, insect colonies, slime mold, many different forms today in which people are very fascinated by these social organisms. And the question that I, I, I lived with this idea of social organism for a long time without really taking, I thought of it as a bit of a metaphor. But the question then arose, well, might it be possible that an organization is a social organism? It's actually a living organism in one way. And if so, how would we justify it? So that's, I've reached the point where I believe that's probably the case. Um, it's got a few propositions uh, that the qualitative aspect of human observation rests not in the brain, but in the phenomena out there. Uh, this is perhaps the third major epistemological alternative in the cybernetics community that affirms identity um, can be reduced to neither materiality nor model, uh, including mental constructs. It's actually a creative organizer at work in the organization. Um, Aristotle described this as entelecheia, the being at work, staying itself. Entelecheia or entelechy, being at work, staying itself would be the translation of the three words that make up this portmanteau word. Um, it's, uh, it's an organization that organizes its own activity. Um, human beings live within it, um, they function within it, and uniquely they have certain capabilities to interact and make decisions within it and shape it. So the pro when we talk about an organization, we include the people within it, they are part of it, and they're making decisions that shape the activity of that organization in a way that is different from in, a, in very important ways from what a, a mere cell is able to do. It exists in an ecological ligation series. That means a bind, they are bound. They're in, they're in a series bound with their environment, interdependent with their environment, giving and receiving principally through value, mutual value, one giving value to the other. Uh, it's pervasive. It happens in every single detail. It's not something that you leave up there in something called system five. System five observes what is happening in every detail in every activity because every activity has certain characteristics that belong to that organization and are necessary for that organization to be functional if the organization is really performant and at its best. I think service is the paradigm form of organic structural design in an organization. That the service encounter, the one that I showed you earlier on between the organization and the customer is, is the paradigm for every single unit within the organization. Each person is providing a service, each unit is providing a service, and in turn is expecting something back that supports them in doing that. And that is the paradigm form for designing an organization effectively. That is consistent with what VSM is designed to do. People 
uh, have a reflexive autonomy, which enables them to have a certain level of choice. And therefore, it's a kind of social organism with its own non-arbitrary, contextually interdependent, self-organizing, inhering identity for the co-creation of value. And um, you can relate that to VSM, and I'll say more about that in a minute. If I'm looking at this then, um, first of all, I think of VSM in several different ways. One of them is as an information systems design tool. So we use it to design the processes for information flow, bearing in mind that information flow doesn't just mean in a computer system. It means that, for example, the marks, the context marks and cues that you put into the organization, including, for example, the textual messaging of people's actions and behavior and words and the manner of giving them, is all constituting a communication text. Each manager in each of their action is a kind of text to the world. And so what you're trying to do is design these information flows in such a way that the information gets to the people who need them at the time that they need them and that it flows from them to the others who need them. Another way of looking at VSM relevance is in looking at modes of functional activity. Um, how is functional activity, by functional I mean system five activity, system four activity, system three and so on activity, organized within the company, how is it distributed? And these two are, are complementary for each other. Um, it's worth remembering in this that uh, the functional activities that take place uh, happen in processes that produce this. So functions are not things, they're processes that take place in certain modes that produce their own outcomes and repeat themselves. Um, a third aspect, spot the deliberate mistake in the title, um, is in relationship to people. And that in a sense is about each individual understanding their, their place in this, what information they need, what information they're giving, where they stand, what their function is at any point in time, because a particular person can change their modality. One minute, one time, they can be doing something that looks like a system five activity, and the next they're doing something that looks like a system one activity. And um, it's, you can easily look at uh, models in which a, a particular person change, goes through all five different models in the course of a day or a week or even some, a much shorter time. So we understand for people to understand their own roles in relationship to this and also for the organization, for leaders, designers and so on to think about what are the roles of different people and how to amplify the capabilities of people in those different roles. So if we look at some effects of this, if identity is pervasive, then it doesn't sit up in system five in some kind of ivory tower. It's happening in the qualitative and productive and operational reality of the ongoing actual behavior. It's happening through the mesh of activities that is identity at work. And the job of S5, system five, is to understand that, to be able to describe that identity in such a way as to be clear about it, to moderate it, to design systems that have sufficient requisite variety to support and steward it, and that help in the training and moderation and stewarding of culture and skills and so on, for example, at S2 level through the organization. So you, you need a system five in order to be clear about what that identity is, but you're not reducing identity to something that happens in S5, it happens everywhere throughout. Um, in this role, leaders have a new kind of role, as I see it, or it's not new, many people have said something like this, but it's certainly different from what a lot of senior people think. They think of the job of being a leader maybe as some kind of introduction of artificial objectives, stretch objectives for the company, some sort of thing that they think they would like it, the organization to be. Whereas I think that what an organization is, is that it has its own inhering potential. And at any point in time, the organization comes more or less close to achieving that potential, often a long way from achieving its real potential. And the job really is to help the organization be at its best, just as my job is to help me to be at my best and to help others around me to be at their best and them to help me. And if we can all help each other to be at our best, what happens is that in the process of being at our best, we learn and our best moves on. What we 
once upon a time couldn't quite do, we learn to be able to do with relative ease, and then something else comes up and a new possibility, a new potential evolves. So you're talking about the evolution of potential. And the job of leaders is to cultivate that evolution of potential. And the purpose of VSM design is to support that process. That requires requisite information. And in particular, it requires requisite information to be able to push info. And I think everybody here will know this. Ensure that the right information is available to everybody in the organization at the time they need it, including the most junior people. Because what you're trying to do is liberate the autonomy of people to be able to use creative skills at the most primary level in the organization in their own activities. But at the same time, to design the system to be able to collect information and remembering that this requisite information isn't just things that happen on a computer. It's all sorts of communication activities and support structures. Um, in S4, this means designing uh, the process of, of activity of S4, how you research the future, which trends you look for in the future and how you understand them. And what kind of innovations and inventions you bring about are related to the identity of the organization. Uh, you, 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 you would automatically be doing that without really thinking about it. But the better your understanding of what the company is in its different facets, the better the tuning of your research and the understanding of trends and how they might affect the future of the company will be, and your ability to tune and design things that fit the organization. For example, BMW talks about its design language. And every organization effectively has got design principles for its offerings and a kind of design language of the things that they produce. So to be clear what that actually is, what's the design principle of this company? What sort of things do we do and how do we do it? And what do we need to be able to do it? Is a really important function that comes out of S4 in sustaining a future. Maintaining unique competence is really important. In S3, obviously, many decisions are being made, and those decisions need to take account of what is this organization? How do we do things? What is our way? What, what is going to sustain us at our best? What, what are we like when we're at our best? Where are we trying to go to fulfill that potential? What things do we have to do in order to achieve it? And therefore, S3 decisions are about that. And therefore, the decisions need to be supported by the requisite information and the re requisite knowledge and understanding of what that of what that actually is. S2 is the structural, the various kinds of structural and physical, like machine computer software that's designed in certain ways, and cultural modes that support people, the smoothing of people's behavior because they fit in and understand how the organization works and what kind of skills and so on are needed, like the skill of the blacksmith. So S5 then is, is, is certainly a crucial role and as i've indicated what's important about it is that there's a requisite understanding of that identity but the kinds of models and ways that organizations go about understanding their identity and describing them are i think mostly deficient they they do things like we this is our values and this is our purpose or something like that and that's about it maybe the marketing department's got a positioning statement and some brand things but other people don't know what that is or have limited understanding or don't care so what goes on in organizations is that the knowledge of the way the organization is is fractured across different departments it's not integrated and often the very sense of what constitutes the identity of an organization lacks requisite variety what um, back between 2002 and 2004, I developed um, with some wonderful colleagues this framework, which has been in development ever since. Um, the basic model hasn't much changed, but lots of understanding about how to use it and talk about it has developed. Um, it's based on something which I won't go into today, and I'm not going to go into the detail of it. But suffice to say, there's a logical circle of 12. So you can start anywhere on the circle. Each one, the next, the one to it on this clock face, the one next to it as it is, as it were, a counter that says, well, that's not quite right. This is what we have to deal with. And the one next one says, well, this is what we have to deal with. And we end up going in a complete logical circle. And one of the consequences of a logical circle is that you've got opposites. So four o'clock is opposite 10 o'clock. 
And you find very frequently in companies that there is a conflict between four o'clock, which is about the cultural values and the principles for people and how they should be behaving, and 10 o'clock, which is the financial model and the rules and principles. So you've got to get wonderful customer service and you've got two minutes to do it with or you'll lose your, your promotion and your bonus. So there has to be a fit between these and these opposites we go back to Varela's not this, not one, not two, then, uh, which is also you, you will find in Hegel, for example, this, this antithesis constitutes a whole. So these, these are six different holes. There are various other patterns within it. And what they pick up is that there's an aspect of identity which is related to what you do, who you do it for, in what way you do it, where this is going in the future, how you work together on it, what, with what purpose in mind, what this means to people, what your agenda for the future is, your strategy, what the talents and skills are that enable you to do this, how you, that makes you different in the world, how the financial structures of the organization work to support that, and what system of signals do you need in order to be able to manage and keep track of all of that, which is, of course, crucial to it's VSM. And that's the end of my presentation, which is, I think, slightly over or a bit over what it was supposed to be, for which I apologize. Um, thank you very much for listening. I appreciate very much um, your interest. I'm hoping that you've had some. And I'm here to take your questions. Thank you, Angus. Really interesting and uh, a really a unique way of dealing with this topic. So I'm sure that there will be a lot of um, questions. Um, I don't know. Nice way of saying. I hope it's a it's a nice way of saying weird as well, because I've certainly found it weird at times to find myself with these thoughts. <laughs> okay. So Trevor, do you have a comment? Do you want to start the conversation? Yeah. Uh, oh, excuse me. I seem to be losing my voice. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you, Trevor. Um, Angus, I mean, a lot of people say that science is reductionist and, and um, all this kind of stuff, but having studied the history, in fact, I'm in the middle of, funnily enough, reading Spratt's History of the Royal Society, published in 1667. And I don't find anything in there that is reductive or any of, any of this stuff at all. Um, Newton wasn't anything to do with the Royal Society until the 1700s. It was founded in 1662. And this is where science really gets going. And I don't find it reductive at all. I know Stafford often said that, but I think this is a misunderstanding of what science actually is. Um, largely as a result of people being stuck in a stereotype of science that's mostly 19th century, uh, which pervades economics and most of what we do. But it's not the nature of science. It is a stereotype uh, that people set up as a kind of straw man to knock down again. And I don't think it really is there at all. Trevor, thank you. So the first thing I would say is that... Um, there's so much of what you say that I 100% thoroughly agree with. In fact, I would say that during the 1600s, there was a real possibility that uh, science might have gone in the direction of something more like alchemy. And there was a lot of alchemists, for example, and there was a lot of interest in alchemy. And it might have gone in a different direction, um, uh, but it didn't, as you say, and various things were consequences. I date it back to 1600 because we can find in certain routes, for example, the way Galileo measured things using his pulse, for example, to count. So he was able to reduce the behavior to a certain number of pulse counts. And by doing that, he was able to be able to get an accurate, repeatable measurement of a phenomenon that was filtered down to certain key details. But it's certainly the case that during the 19th century is when very many radical steps were taken towards the increase of, um, towards an increase in what you say, reduc reductionism and positivism. Um, but there are roots that go back to, for example, Descartes and his, his decisions about uh, what constitutes reality and what was 
what was subjective and what was not. But it's an all evolving process. Um, you can look at Bacon and his, dis, his use of the concept of law as a way of overcoming, um, of, he uses law because he's a lawyer in such a way as to overcome the model that came from the scholastics to eliminate them and to replace with a different inductive logic for understanding science. But science is lots of different things. There have been people who've opposed this view throughout the period. There have always been people who do not follow the orthodox line. So I'm certainly characterizing what I see as being something more like the orthodox, the popular, it's what you find on the BBC and so on. And it's also in many cases been what has been necessary for academics in various roles to be able to have their jobs and to be able to maintain them. And and it's played into what you find in business schools and the kinds of systemic models that they often use. So I, I agree very much with your principle, but I don't think that there's anything you said which invalidates my concerns with the uh, present, the, the dominant ideological view of science. I'm not against science, quite the opposite. I'm, I believe passionately in science. But I think that there have been flaws in the dominant orthodoxy, and in particular, well, the things that I spoke about earlier. Yeah, I mean, the fact of the matter is that uh, <clears throat> that model of science started to break down <clears throat> with 1905 with relativity theory. Uh, and 20th century physics is not like this at all. But most of us have not noticed the fact that science has moved on. Most of what we think about science is about 100 years out of date, frankly. Unfortunately, yes. that's not really true. So what we have with that, I'm not saying that relativity theory didn't change the world of physics or that quantum um, mechanics didn't change it again. They certainly did. But they're, they're sciences that are based on mathematical structures to describe the deep fundamentals of the universe. And their goal is to be able to reduce everything down to those mathematical structures. The goal is to be able to explain all of it, everything, in a single mathematical model. Now, I don't believe that will ever be possible. No, nor do I. And I don't understand why anybody would think that. Exactly. <clears throat> given, given that quantum mechanics completely contradicts that anyway. So it, it, I think... It does. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, not, it's still not very good at dealing with the level of phenomena that we're dealing with, which are macro phenomena uh, and not and not the micro and nano phenomena of the world. So we're dealing with a, with a world in which the behaviors are certainly subtle, but they're not fundamentally belonging to um, quantum mechanics, which is also only ever dealing with the traces, the observational traces of certain types of behavior in the atomic and elemental world, as we best understand it today as a result of the instruments that are used to do so. Yeah, okay, thank you. I, I see Wolfgang, you have a question or something. And also, you, so I'm not sure who came first. up first. I think it might've been you because you're up on the left. So therefore I'm guessing that Zoom is telling me you asked first. <laughs> well, um, it continues your conversation, but hopefully brings it back to identity as well. So first of all, I take the first question as being related to what is the identity of science? Has it changed? Is that significant? And we could use that as an example to, to go into perhaps the question I was thinking about here in terms of we have, you can think about um, identity as a verb, so identification. So for whom for whom is this identification useful? And um, if you have a sense of identity that is synonymous with the means by which an organization creates itself or something similar, for whom is that useful? Um, that's probably enough on one plate. <laughs> yes, if I, uh, if I understand you right, Hugh, then my response goes, as follows. Um, 
it, it matters probably a great deal what sense of your identity I have as I speak to you now or on any other occasion. And similarly, what your sense of my identity is as we speak to each other. So the identity that we have, the identity that we perceive as observers of each other or of an organization like Hertz or anything else uh, matters in what kinds of behaviors and what kind of responses we have, whether we, for example, get immediately angry at the point at the moment we see each other or whether we greet each other with open arms, for example. Um, but these, while these affect the inhering identity that you have and that I have, I'm saying that in order for my ongoing existence as me or your ongoing existence as you, you have an identity that may be affected in due course by how I see you and vice versa. But it can't be reduced to how I see you, nor vice versa. It goes right down deep into the biological processes of the organization of the organism of you or of me, and similarly down into the deep processes and biologies of the organization. And that what happens is that if I misunderstand you, um, I may mistreat you in some way. Similarly, if I become the CEO of an organization and I misunderstand it, then I've been placed in a position which gives me a great deal of power over that organization because I'm embedded in it. I'm part, now part of it, but I'm embedded in, in such a way that I have the power to do harm within it if I misunderstand it. And that's why it's important for the, the more powerful, in inverted commas, you are in an organization, the more important it is to understand what this organization could be if it was working at its best. And there are ways, which I didn't touch on, that we found that are really quite remarkable for doing that. But uh, you seem to be suggesting that there is um, virtue in having, um, let's call it an architectural coherence that's recursive. But it, is that the, I think that's that's probably in my mind that's probably the, the biggest open question about for ex whether one should have this 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 explicitly recognised um, inner coherence or not. But the rest of what you're saying certainly you know it's 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 certainly stimulating. The other thing I would suggest, of course, is that what you are putting forward is quite a, a rich cybernetic or at least processual model and so its epistemological uses are going to only be for a sort of people that think in that way and so the identity that people will take most people's notion of an identity of hurts isn't going to be that because they just don't think in that way okay Hugh that's a really brilliant question Wolfgang do you mind if I answer it before I come to you I'll take that as a yes yeah sure you sure don't. so um, I can answer these two together in a way. When we work with the organization, you know, we've been working with organizations for decades. And, um, and in the paper that I just published, there's a big fat section that discusses how it was used by IBM and by the IBM leadership at a worldwide level. But the process involves a very simple tool that works operationally, and that we've never found managers not understanding. What we do is we take people telling stories. Um, literally, you could take one person with one story and get not a bad picture. But in practice, it's multiple people, very often a leadership team brought together in a workshop. But it's been done with hundreds of people in multiple groups inside organizations as well. What do we do? We basically ask, tell me a story about when you experience the organization at its best, in the zone, in peak performance, wonderful. So you were proud of it. So you were glad you were in this organization. So you thought, this is how we should be all the time. Something like that. Some moment where you thought, that's just great. If only we could be like that all the time. So you actually 
experienced and can remember well. Now, please describe it in what in ethnographic terms is called thick description, rich, detailed, phenomenologically descriptive detail. And what I'm telling you is that we have again and again and again and again been able to derive from this one description all the 12 aspects that you saw in the model that I showed you. We're able to derive what does this organization produce? What kind of value does it have for people? How is it experienced? How does the organization work? And so on. And why would this be the case? Because when an organization is functional, then it has uh, at that time an operational to the where it's functional, it has an operational inherent congruence and coherence taking place whereby the identity of the whole is found in the identity of that particular activity. In the same way that we talk about DNA as being pervasive throughout the organization. Every cell in the body operates on the same DNA. So each and every situation which is func truly functional, you can always understand an organization better when you look at it at its best than when it's dysfunctional. Dysfunctional is how it shouldn't be. So you look at it when it's functional and you say, what is happening here? And at that point, you can derive all 12 of these as a reality, you describe them. Now, when you get groups of people, like the whole leadership team or the whole of the service team in an organization to do this process, and they end up coming to descriptions and they all agree these descriptions, this is what it's like when we're at our best. And we're dealing with something that has an empirical reality behind it. And it's not that we're layering it in or imposing it or inventing it, we're finding it. And that may be hard to believe, but when we think about the underlying science that says, well, why wouldn't an organization that has an, that has an operational process, why wouldn't you find that there's certain patterns and that these patterns are types that belong to it uniquely? And that's how it enables itself to keep on doing the same thing and when it's doing it well, we can look at those and understand how the different aspects of the organization work. Aspect being a crucial cybernetic term. So the 12, the 12 aspects that we, you can recognize. So they're observational units, certainly, but they're aspects of what is going on there. And they form a circle, and therefore there's a kind of logical unity about the 12 that we identify. But I feel I should take the question from, Hugh, from Wolfgang, uh, and maybe we'll come back to this or something else. Uh, I hope that was helpful. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Angus and uh, Wolfgang. Um, there, there are other people that are um, wanting to ask questions. So we have in the queue John Lee and David and Leonardo and Ely and John Waters. Okay. I better answer shortly. Yes. So, John, you have to unmute. John, John you are mute. You are still mute. You are still muted. Sorry, were you talking to me? No, John. No, Wolfgang. Oh. Yeah. Shall I ask my question or? Oh, so, sorry, Wolfgang. I didn't uh, realize that you were in the sorry. middle. No, no, no problem. So, no, no, let's no. finish with you first. Yes, yes, go yeah. on. Angus, th thank you very much for your <laughs> very inspiring talk. And uh, I like very much your process perspective on identity. It's a very difficult subject, and that raised my a question, a very spontaneous question. I don't have an answer, just probably your view. I mean, for me, the question uh, came up, sp sprang to my mind, is why are we talking about identity at all? Meaning, what's the function of identity? Why do we use this term? I mean, coming from Luhmann, every, every word is a distinction, makes a distinction, but why do we use identity? <laughs> Well, what kind of distinction does it make? What's the opposite of, or what is sort yeah, of the It's complex? because I haven't, I haven't found a better word and we collectively maybe haven't found a better word. What, let's call it for the moment, goat. What is goat? Goat is when these things and these things and these things and these things are operating in a certain way in such a way that these and these and these and these fit together, but not like a jigsaw. Mm -hmm. Like the whole has produced them because that's what it needs in order to do what it's trying to do in the world, what it's trying to be in the world. Mm -hmm. So it needs these things to do it. Mm -hmm. And in the process of 
constituting these things, it does things, and in the process of doing those things, it learns and changes and evolves itself. So an organization, I mean, the company that I work, when I did this project with IBM, it's taken 10 years before we could publish some of the stuff, partly because it was very critical. Mm. It, was, it was preparing for its centennial. So it was 199 years old, approaching 100 years old, and it had been doing things with a certain pattern through that time. And, and certain decisions had been made in the previous 20 years, 30 years, that had been disastrous for the company because they didn't belong to this organization. So when you start to do things that don't really belong to this organization, you introduce a pathology. So another way of looking at it, and it's the first way I did way back in 1991, I called it the healthy organization. It's how do you get healthy? Mm. And healthy means you're living according to the rightness of your, for a human being, the rightness of your personality, your body, your capabilities, what you should be doing in the world, and so on. Mm -hmm. Which has an ethical connotation. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Thoroughly. No, because because you, the minute theory, you I mean, go it, wrong on that, you lose the trust. It's, it's, you could say it's just, you know, um, it, it's, not, and it's not a moral issue. It's just a question yeah. of patterns. In the talk that I did to the ASC recently, I argued that there was a moral order to the world. So there's a, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a physical order of the world in which determinism is real. It's, you know, something happens to something. It ba something bangs something, it will fall over or something will happen to it because of forces. And then there's a living order of the world in which instincts are li in living organisms and they act counter external interference. Not, they're not, they're mm -hmm. active agents, not passive. And then there's a moral order because the human being is able to anticipate an outcome and choose between them. Mm -hmm. And the ability to choose, which is a functional order of being human, The capacity to do that means that we actually have a different causal structure for what happens in the world. What happens is a result of choice, not merely natural instinct. It's something that's decidable at some level, not all the time. It's difficult, but to the extent that it's decidable, how organizations go about deciding these things is crucial. And if we look at Facebook, it's an example of a company that's made a number of decisions that, in my opinion, are very degrading for the world and for itself. But there's an underlying logic in which there's clearly a huge need for people to meet and convene, communicate and so on. There were other ways in which they could have done this, mm -hmm. which could and they could still do, which would be far more ethical than the, one that, the ones that they are currently operating by. Mm -hmm. John, will you next? I hope so. Uh, hopefully I'm communicating. Um, I loved your talk. I thought it was not weird at all. I thought you did a great job of covering a variety of subjects and looking at it from a BSM perspective. I want to make five <coughs> points. Amos Traversky and Danny Kahneman and I and you would have a very long conversation about human nature and how the modern world is not doing an adequate job of explaining people. Half the people in the United States do not believe in evolution. They think the way this country was in 1950 is the only way it could possibly be, and they don't have any idea of change. Number three, centralization has dominated thinking since the Roman Catholic Church, and we have too much of it. We need to decentralize. Number five, we need to go to a human scale. All of the things you've been talking about have been institutional impositions on the ability of humans to interact with each other. And so we have all these imaginary bureaucratic things in our way between each other that have been invented since World War II. I, I loved your talk. John, I, 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 you've made your life pretty easy for me because all I have to do is say, yes, I agree. I, I would amplify, it wasn't just the Roman Catholic Church, important as they are. They borrowed it from the Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire borrowed it from the Egyptians. It's actually a structure that goes right back to the hierarchy. And in those days, of course, it was a structural order that came from their perception of a divinity above. And that the job of the leader, the pharaoh or whatever, was in some way to be a servant of all of the people by acting for the divine order of what was needed on earth. And what has been left behind is just a power structure. Anyone who's next, uh, Angela, on this? Well, we have an Alena raising a hand and a few. Ah, yes, Alena, thank you. 
have been uh, making comments that I will ask later if they want to okay. do the comments publicly. Yes. Hello, Elena. Nice hey. to see you. Nice to see you too. Um, I wonder if I could ask you to elaborate a little bit on your use of the word proprio-poesis. I, I did some, uh, some work trying to get around, uh, get an idea of organizational proprio-perception. And I wondered if your proprio-poesis, uh, you know, essentially I'd like to know more about what it is. Right, thank you very much. So it's a name I give to the theory that I've been developing. Uh, why did I give that name in part um, in, in part, it, it means proprio actually comes from Latin, so I'm breaking a certain rule. Proprio comes from Latin, poiesis from Greek. Uh, proprio means of its own, and poiesis means something like an aesthetic production. Mm -hmm. So the poie, the, all of the, f in, in ancient Athens, for, for example, there were all of these craft and production centers from shipbuilding to textiles in the home. And the making of them was called poiesis and the centers or craft centers where they were done were the poetic. Mm -hmm. And uh, this poetic process was something that via Cavantes and so on was picked up by Maturana and he was used in his autopoiesis. So I didn't want to call it autopoiesis, first of all, because I don't think I perfectly reflect or follow Humberto although I found it immensely valuable and I find a lot of similarities. But also I was at that time very conscious that he wanted to separate it out from the soci sociological. And so I didn't want to just say I'm using this. I'm using, I'm saying I'm using something that borrows from, from this process. It borrows from it. And the fact that it was an aesthetic production is important because I think that there's a qualitative dimension to all of the behavior of, for example, every cell when it's processing is responding qualitatively to its contextual environment. So uh, it's the no, it started with the recognition that organizations are unique. I mean, I had a very practical experience. Um, a long time ago, I went to work for IBM. I'd been a teacher and um, as a teacher, uh, it, it was working fine, except that I didn't earn enough money to live. And, and also, I felt I'd been in school all my life since I was a kid. I needed to experience something outside education. So the only people who were really taking the unqualified, because, you know, I had a degree at Oxford and everything in English literature, and I'd been a teacher, but it didn't qualify me for most jobs. And I now had a wife and family and so on. And the computing industry would train me, and IBM gave me a year's training. Now, one of the consequences of going into an organization is what I found is that literally from the from what in back in those days that we talk about 1979, 80, 81, from the cars that were parked outside the building to the reception, to the walk to the offices of the DP manager, which is who I was very often meeting or the finance manager, by what kind of machines were there, what the reception was like, I could work out whether this company was likely to be a customer of IBM or not. And you could experience the difference from one company to another. There are no two companies that are the same. They're all unique. They can be very similar, but they're different. They cannot be anything else when you think about it. So I've been very interested in this uniqueness. And the other side of that is really interested in how organizations, the systems development that I did was about how an organization treats individuals as individuals, each human being individually. And what I've been concerned about in all of the methods is how does an organization enable all of the people in the company to become autonomous, to be able to take more action, but at the same time to achieve alignment. It seems to me that what leaders are trying to do, especially with these huge companies, is find ways in which everybody can operate and organize themselves, can do things out of their own initiative, can find their own creativity, and yet be aligned. And so the question is, how could that be brought about? And that's been an inquiry a long time. So in cybernetics, you have this beautiful structure of understanding the observer. So for me, a fundamental unit is the situation. It's not a system, it's a situation. And situations produce situations and situations arise. So I am in my situation, you're in your situation. But at the moment, 
our situations are meeting in the conversation that we're having. And I'm afraid I'm doing most of the talking. So with propriopoiesis, it's a fairly detailed, rich structure around which I'm crafting a lot of different models. So the Cistercian, the Ulfbert, um, the Silk Route, very different. The, um, the British Navy at the time of the war against Nelson, of uh, Napoleon and modern companies looking at detailed case studies of how they work to illustrate this principle, as well as trying to d understand the nature of how it works be to be able to demonstrate that it's reasonable to think of a company as a living organism. Mm -hmm. Living because when you look at the detailed mesh of interactions, which include the whole living body, remember with an organization we're dealing with we're not leaving the human complexity of a human body out. We're bringing the complexity of a human body in and other ones and the fine detail of description, fine detail of understanding of the micro communications that take place between people in those situations. So what kind of patterns do they operate and how do they function? And as I say, I see cybernetics is really crucial, the sort of central science for helping us to do that but it's deeply informed by the picture that derives from Goethe of metamorphosis, which understands that there's a fundamental unity to living organisms that produces variations on its theme, like, like a composer produces variations on a theme in a musical piece. It's a very good analogy. And that there is a kind of orchestration of the organization according to thematic patterns. And these different thematic patterns have to interplay, like the leitmotifs in a Wagner opera. And these different patterns are patterns of how you make money and patterns of how you do things and patterns of who you do them for and where you do them and what it is you do and so on. Um, and uh, because, because it was a big thing and I didn't want to do bring it out and because I got derailed by various things like the last two years in the cybernetic society, I've done almost no writing at all on this. Um, then, you know, it's been held back a little bit. But in the process, I've learned a great deal. And, you know, I'm ready to go back and do some more, um, having learned from it. So thank you for a, a short question. I apologize to everybody for a long answer. I hope I haven't wasted your time in that answer. But I'm glad to have been able to share it with you publicly. Um, yeah. Angela, Angela, can I ask a, a question, please? Of course. Hello, Raul. Hello, Angus. And it is a short question, uh, again, following uh, Alena's question. It, you made the, the connection between organizational closure and identity. Uh, can you uh, explain in more depth what is that makes uh, identity uh, connected to organizational closure? And what is that we can learn from organizational closure to discuss and work out the identity of an organization? That's a fascinating question. It's a lovely question and one I um, thought about a lot. So the first thing that struck me is that when I looked at uh, the description of organizational closure, as you find it in Varela and, and, and so on, and, and in cybernetics and autopoiesis, um, it seemed to me, now I, I really don't like the word mechanism because, um, because I don't like when we're describing living things as mechanisms or mechanistic. But there isn't, the, I couldn't see what's the functional unit of organizational closure. Now, step one, what is organizational closure as I understand it? What I understand they understand it as, as well more or less, is first of all, it's a process. It's not a thing. So um, it's first of all, it's not a physical thing. It's a process. It involves information and it involves something else that I will talk about at a moment. So the information matters insofar as there's observation that sees something and says it is or isn't the way it ought to be. So white blood cells flowing through the blood, finding 
a foreign, what they perceive as a foreign body and swallowing them in order to get rid of them is organizational closure. That is, that is a, an activity of the body that is so organized that it's capable of saying this belongs and that doesn't. And that which belongs stays in and is enabled to do the things it should do. And that which doesn't belong should in some way be eliminated. Now that's related to the most fundamental levels that you find in perceptual control theory and cybernetics. You're walking along a pavement, you're walking in a straight line, you're quite happy to walk along a straight line until you see in front of you a puddle. And so because that puddle is an interference, you walk around the puddle and carry on. That's described in perceptual control theory, cybernetics, and so on. In the same way, the white blood cell finds this thing here, this pathogen, swallows it and deals with it. That's organizational closure. It's also, for example, a customs and, and immigration department. It's what when you go into a country and you have to show your passport and they let you in or they don't let you in. That's a national organizational closure. So... Certainly what I could understand is that there are such processes happening in the body and they're structured, but there seemed to be a missing element. And the answer to that missing element for me was found in Stewart's theory called ternary theory. This is David Stewart, the former vice president of the Cybernetic Society. And he developed a notion of imparity. So he argues that there are three fundamental ontolog ontological levels. There's energy, which cybernetics is not interested in, you find that in Ashby and so on, as you know. This level is not our fundamental interest. Of course, it's of fundamental importance. But the point about living organisms and, and cybernetic organisms is that they set about managing those. You can find, for example, in, in the little robots that made their way to the power station and plugged themselves in in order to be able to repower themselves up again, way back when you find the beginning of this process of an attempt to be able to build that into machines as well. So organisms find the energy that they need, for example, by hunting or by feeding and browsing and so on. So there's that level, which doesn't belong fundamentally to cybernetics. Then there's a second level, which we call information. And we have to be clear what information really means. Information at this point is, is perceived by an observer. It's not something out there floating around. It's, as it, it's something that's filtered out of the world and perceived as being relevant. <laughs> but when we look at it, it's, we mostly think of it in terms of distinctions. And the distinctions that we're talking about are, in the human being, the working of intellect. So it is the intellect that can say, this is different to this and know it. Or the more unconscious levels, for example, emotional responses, that I like it or I don't like it. And there's a whole plethora of different emotional, you know, a cloud of different emotions on the positive and negative side, joy, happiness, serenity, pleasure, peacefulness, and so on. On the one hand, hate, anger, disgust, and so on on the other side. So we have these, these fundamental notions. And what Stuart said is that there is a third entity that she called imparity. And this is the difference between two different information sets, that this compared with this, I understand the difference between the two and I like this one more. In order to be able to like something more, you actually have to bring the qualitative and you have to bring in the human being the emotional side. You, you, it's essential to build the emotional aspect of knowing the world and navigating the world into the scientific frame. Rather than excluding it as contingent, you have to make it central to the actual process of activity. And the process that he called imparity, which I do not think he fully developed in terms of its capability and is not developed mostly in VSM and things like that, is really crucial. Because what's going on in the customer, a customer chooses you over you, Hertz over Swift cars or something like that, or the other way around. And afterwards, they say this was a great experience or a bad experience, and they come back or they don't. All of those involve qualitative experiences and emotional judgments. And I think that what we need to add to the, the rational cognitive element of information is the emotional, affective, aesthetic 
qualitative response that goes into that, that interprets that in relationship to a person. And one of the points I was making is that customers in particular look for organizations that fit their own needs, which means their own identity in life, their own processual identity. So organizational closure in summary is the ability to say whether it fits or doesn't, whether it belongs or doesn't, which is really critical for a healthy organization. Secondly, the process of being able to discern that and it, that requires requisite variety of information and so on. And behind that, the recognition that there is a qualitative dimension to that. And there's an instrument built into the process for making that kind of judgment at a whole human level, which we call emotion, along with the cognitive elements that we're very familiar with. Angus, just a, a short point. You started saying that you don't go along with the idea of a mechanism. But then most of the things you have been describing and talking about, in my mind, come as expressions of mechanism. Also, you have said oh, cybernetics is all about information and not about energy. However, in my mind, cybernetics is all about resources and the way in which these resources help us to um, organize a situation that requires uh, attention and uh, requires to be in relationship with its uh, surroundings. So somehow I think you have a very, you have offered to me a very, very comprehensive picture of uh, uh, some form of epistemology But uh, in a way, the ideas of cybernetics and so on have been left out. What well, we, this, may be, this may be a question where we have a different understanding of, uh, of the subject and we may have a different view and that, that's okay. Um, regarding mechanism, I think mechanisms are really important in all sorts of places where mechanisms are used. And a person may use the word mechanism with a meaning that they understand to be different, but because, because maybe I'm a bit of a literal person and I like language, I think of mechanisms as something that are related to mechanics. And so if we look at, for example, the structure of the arm and the way that the bones work and the way the elbow works, I'm very happy to call that a mechanism and the elbow works as a mechanism for the arm to do things. But, but I wouldn't call The intellect, the intellect in its making a differentiation between this point and that point, a mechanism, for example. So I restrict, I restrict the word mechanism to things that are mechanical and have an organizational structure that are mechanical. And because living organisms are not structured mechanically, but on a different organizational basis, I talk about them as organizations. And I think the best term that I found is the equivalent to mechanism to describe what others call mechanism is function, that it has a certain functional property. So I talk, I talk about what others call mechanism, but I call it function because I want to make a distinction between the types of activities that belong to things that have mechanical properties and the types of things that happen to things that within that which is living or in a living process. Regarding the second one, resources are certainly important. And I think that uh, the kinds of sociological theories like structuration theory that deal with resources are really important. But actually a structure doesn't exist, a resource doesn't exist until an observer perceives it as a resource and uses it. So the fundamental unit to begin with is an observer observing the world and acting in relation to the world. In the process, they find that they need a resource. So they turn to a resource and use it or and they have it or they don't have it. The resource might be an inner capability like something they know, or it might be an external thing, like a tool that they need, like a screwdriver to, to undo a screw. So they turn to resources, and resources are essential inside organizations. There's no question about the deployment of resources. But before a resource becomes a resource, there is already an observer, and the observer is perceiving and seeing. And what are they seeing? Well, I think that information is a, a bit of a reductive word to use, but it is the common word in cybernetics. So you're perceiving something which constitutes for you 
something that becomes a conception and understanding and interpretation of the world. As I say, I draw on a hermeneutic tradition that goes back to the 17th century <coughs> for interpreting texts. And, and that has the other side. So I'm not saying that resources aren't crucial to the process, but I don't find this non-cybernetic to say that I begin with observers observing the world and finding contexts and responding to them. I think that's central to cybernetics. If you don't agree, then we may just have a different understanding of what cybernetics is. I think the only thing that is clear to me is that there is plenty to talk about. Yes, I'm sure. And, uh, and therefore, I'm not going to continue. Well, thank you. Thank you Very you gracious. Much. Thank you, Raul and Angus. Really interesting conversation. I know that there are a couple of people that wanted to, to talk, but uh, I am aware of time and we are running a little bit later than expected. So I think uh, we're going to give it a close. And uh, thank you very much, Angus. Really interesting conversation. And uh, I'm sure that we will continue uh, for another hour. But um, it's, it, it, I think that everybody is uh, tired and have other commitments. So. Thank you again. And I'm very grateful to you for listening and for finding anything interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, well, see you in a couple of weeks. Um, the next one, I think, is uh, Panagiotis talking about the BSM and sustainability. So, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Have a good Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.